basically start with a disclaimer that there will be no quantum mechanics in my talk. Um, I hope we will still be interested. It's about uh, the integrated information theory of consciousness, which um, was developed, conceived by Julia Tononi, who is at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and who I worked with um, for the past six years. And um, more than convince you about this theory, uh, I want to give you an overview and um, show you the importance of some of the questions that the theory is trying to address. So um, that there are actual problems that are not typically tackled by neuroscientific theories of consciousness, um, but that are important. And um, physicists tend to see the importance of these questions a bit more than neuroscientists who just start from the brain and want to figure out where consciousness comes from. So um, when I talk about consciousness, I mean to have an experience. So um, what it is like to be you, to feel pain, not to um, register pain, not to act for the pain, but to actually feel it. So what it feels like to be you. Um, consciousness is what goes away when one falls into dreamless sleep. So when you're unconscious, the entire world vanishes for you. Um, consciousness is not, however, just self-reflection. Self-reflection can be part of the content of your experience, but it is not a necessary property for just having the experience. Right? On the other hand, consciousness is not just of the environment. So while in dreamless sleep, you are considered to be unconscious, um, when you're dreaming, you are experiencing and that is equivalent to being um, conscious. That also means that consciousness is not about responsiveness, because when you are dreaming in REM sleep, for example, but um, you're disconnected from the world, so everything is happening inside your head, and that is sufficient um, for being conscious. So the question that um, your scientists have to uh, tried to, to figure out over the past maybe 25 years since it became sort of acceptable again to even address the topic of, of consciousness in medicine and, um, and neuroscience is uh, what are reliable markers of consciousness? How can we figure out if somebody who is in coma, for example, um, is actually conscious or, or not, right? And um, the problem is that uh, there isn't a good marker in the brain that just tells you if somebody is conscious or not. So we do know that it cannot be just the number of involved neurons. Yes? I was a little puzzled by your last slide where you mentioned that breathing implies being conscious. Yes. So what would be the difference between having a lucid dream and having a lucid dream in terms of consciousness? Uh, nothing in terms of consciousness. Just in terms of the content of consciousness and that you are an agent um, that can actually... So there is an additional content to your lucid dreaming experiences that would um, be the content of being an actor in the world as just opposed to passively perceiving like a movie or something. But in both cases you are um, perceiving something, you are experiencing something, right? And that, that's, that's what I'm talking about, right? not any feelings of agency that could be a part of your experience. So it's very interesting because because some people just have no problem with this, but some people you can talk to forever and they still don't really know what I mean with the, the quality of the experience, what, what pain is different. So the only real um, concept where there is a clear distinction in, in biology, for example, is a nociception of pain. Right? So, so typically, all, even bacteria are supposed to have nociception, which means that they can respond to toxic stimuli and all. But then there's the question, does that come with an experience of pain? And, and, and that's sort of the clearest example of what I'm talking about is the pain and not the reaction. So, right, so back to the markers. So, so I mean, there's big consensus that at least like the brain is where your consciousness resides in your body, right? But then within the brain, so it can't be that um, the, the number of neurons, the more neurons you have, the more conscious you are, right? That, that doesn't, uh, that can't be true because we know that, for example, 
the cerebellum um, in your in your brain has actual more actually more neurons than, than your cortex, yet you can take out the cerebellum and there's no impairment um, to your, your conscious experiences. Um, it's also not just the level of brain activity, so more firing of the neurons uh, would be more conscious. That cannot be true because, for example, during epileptic seizures, um, there is very high brain activity and yet um, often people are unconscious during their seizures. Um, it can also not just be the brain metabolic rate, so the more, um, maybe in thermodynamic terms, the more the brain is using fuel, the more conscious you are. No, that can't really be true because patients can regain consciousness from coma without any changes in the brain metabolic rate, for example. And um, another proposal that's been prominent for a while is that somehow synchronization or fast frequency oscillation in the thalamocortical systems would be an, an indicator for consciousness. But um, also in non-REM sleep, in anesthesia and um, during seizures, there is um, your brain is more synchronized than it is while you're awake. So you would expect there to be more consciousness, but in fact there isn't. So uh, that is um, what the science has been on, on consciousness in the last as I said, 20, by now 35 years is to figure out the neural correlates of consciousness. So the, the idea is that you can somehow correlate the content or the level of consciousness to um, neuronal mechanisms. And um, the correlates would be the minimal neuronal mechanisms that are jointly sufficient for any specific conscious content. So as you know, whenever you see this particular neuronal state, you would have this particular experience. Uh, and then the hope is that from there we could derive generalized principles that would tell us something about, about the nature of consciousness. And um, as I mentioned already, there, that there's a distinction between the level of consciousness, which doesn't have to do anything with the content. So there's a contrast between, for example, being awake or being in dreamless sleep. And you could look at the brain in those two states and just see what is different in those two states. Or um, what um, another state where, where you as a healthy person could be unconscious would be during anesthesia. But for, for healthy people, it's generally either you are or you aren't conscious. Right? There's not so much of a continuum there. Um, this can be different for, for brain patients, uh, for patients with brain lesions where part or large parts of the cortex can be damaged. You could imagine a state of consciousness somewhere between the wake and the I have a question for uh, when you talk about consciousness, you are saying you said to human consciousness. Um, it, or yes, at the you, moment. Did you so include, you know, other biological systems and then even Right. So so I'm I'm starting from the experiences that we can access empirically and that is only our own. Um, then once we have a principle and a theory we can go and see if other beings or other like animals and so on can have conscious, but the only experiences that we can observe in a sense are our own, right? And this is the, the big um, block for doing any kind of research on consciousness and while it hasn't been researched for a long time was taboo to speak of that it's not that you, so I, I don't even know that you're conscious, right? I, I have no way to actually test that. I only know that I am conscious and um, by inference, because because your brain is built the same way as my brain, and because you're so similar to me, I I, I say that you are conscious. But that already that already like requires a lot of um, assumptions that, that that consciousness comes from the physical, that it somehow depends on the physical structure of, of our brains and so on. Right? So it's we'll come to. Um, what else is conscious, but the experiences that we can access and that I start from our human experience. The way you would define it, feeling experiences. No, I, I mean, animal, or like according, experience, having an experience. But according to the theory, it's actually very, very broad on yes. what can and can what can have consciousness. But um, that's not how it starts. Yes? It's a clarification question about the concept of consciousness that you're working with. Um, so you're using a model of perception analogy to perception, it sounds like. Um, is there a difference between 
heretical and non heretical cases? What is heretical? So, in the sense that, you know, perception, we, have, we usually think we know what it is for perception to be functioning correctly. Yes. 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 And so is there a distinction like that, a uh, standard of proper function for consciousness? No. So, so a priori consciousness is not necessarily related to any specific function, right? So that, that would already be a theory, right? So if, if you think it's related to some function, that is already your theory. It's, so there is no reason to think that a priori. So you just have these experiences. And then we do know that there is actually quite a, a lot of um, actions and um, action perceptions that can be um, performed unconsciously, right? So th there's an amazing amount, actually, of, of like people can walk around, open cupboards, and when they're sleepwalking, and they're n not necessarily conscious in the sense that, that um, you're <coughs> conscious when you're awake. So um, there's also a lot of experiments on, for example, sensory integration, that um, if the binding of, of auditory and um, visual stimuli that potentially can be done um, unconsciously. And uh, also attention is not, like focusing your attention on something is not, so, is, not is, is dissociated from being conscious of, of something. So you can actually put your, your attention can be drawn by unconscious <coughs> life, for example. So, so there's a lot of processes that go on in the brain that are not um, associated with consciousness and there is no single one that would be associated with consciousness and would never happen. Um, unconsciously as far as we know them. Um, but, so I was talking about the distinction between um, the level and the content. So you can have a contrast between the different um, states, being conscious, being unconscious. Um, or you can actually look for the neural correlates of the content of consciousness, meaning that um, you for example, what has been done a lot is you show stimuli that are barely, barely visible. So you show always the same stimulus, but then the participants only see it in half of the trials, right? And then you can look inside the brain, which brain areas do correlate with the subjects actually seeing the stimuli, and which, which um, just reflect the inputs to the retina. Because on your retina, you still always get the same stimulus, right? And and then the question is, um, which areas correlate with the, the perception of the stimulus, the conscious perception? Uh, another task is uh, binocular rivalry. So there's two pictures given to each of your eyes. And then an interesting thing happens where when with like one hertz um, frequency, you see one picture or you see the other picture. But for example, in the primary visual cortex, both the information of both pictures is present, although you, you don't see both pictures at the same time ever. Right? And um, so that's been the kind of research that's going on and that has been going on in, in, uh, in neuroscience. And now um, the advances over the past couple of years has been that, that to dissociate um, reporting on the stimuli from from actually just uh, experiencing them. Because the problem is that there's still always a difference between like, when you see it, you say you, you see it, and when you don't see it, you say you don't see it. So there's brain um, areas activated just because of, of your differences in how you report on, on, the, on the conscious experiences that don't necessarily are correlates with the actual experience. Right? So it's really difficult to find out um, which parts of the brain actually directly contribute to the experience itself and which just correspond or correlate with, with reporting or using that information for any functional purpose. So um, the, I wouldn't say completely established view on, on which parts of the brain are uh, giving rise to consciousness, but uh, a good take is that, that mostly the posterior parts of your brain, so mostly the perceptual areas, and, um, uh, are the areas in your brain that are directly contributing to the experience. So for example, there is uh, the fusiform face area. Whenever um, you see faces, there will be activity in this area, and um, when for example, 
epileptic patients sometimes get um, electrodes implanted in their brains, right? So that's the best causal test that, that can be performed. Then when this area gets stimulated, people report seeing faces even if there is no face, right? So, so those, um, those neurons seem to directly um, make your, contribute to your experience. Um, but as you, as you can see here, there's also um, those are puzzles. Um, so, for example, as I already said, the cerebellum has 70 billion neurons, while the, while the cortex only has 16 billion neurons, um, and the cerebellum doesn't seem to participate in the conscious. But this neurons, hmm? they um, so usually when people are um, uh, for for some reason have a damaged cerebellum, they have problems with motor stability and. Um, Acting, but actually they are surprisingly capable still. So yeah. elephants, for example, have a giant cerebellum, and the idea is that, that it's um, it's for motor stabilizing of the trunk because it's so fine. Um, and so it has to do with the fine motor control. Um, and uh, right, so then there's also the problem of distinguishing um, background conditions. So so. Um, Neural activity, for example, that you need in order to be conscious, that is necessary, but they're not sufficient for creating any perceptive, um, or, well, let's say, of course you need to be alive, like you need blood in the brain. If you don't have blood in the brain, you don't have experiences, but that doesn't mean that the blood in your brain uh, is a correlate of, of the experience, right? And the same is true for, for example, brainstem activity. So the brain um, sends um, um, sort of baseline activation to the rest of the brain. Without the activity from the brainstem, the cortex cannot function, right? But that doesn't mean that the brainstem is what makes you conscious. So if you could um, just electrically stimulate the brainstem, and that has been shown um, recently, at least in animals, you, you can actually wake somebody up from coma. And uh, one of those questions that I have been talking about that neuroscientists often don't really appreciate is that there is also a, a question on um, why, why are we looking at neurons in the first place, right? Because if, if consciousness is a property of, of the physical world, or if so, there's some physical, um, some part of physics that corresponds to consciousness, why is that? neurons. So why isn't it, um, or, or, so at the moment what we think is that it's neurons or groups of neurons that, that are um, correlated with, with items in your experience um, and that your temporal, the temporal extent of an experience is about 100 milliseconds, give or take. Right? So, so consciousness clearly runs at a, at a macro physical scale. It's not quarks that are relevant. I'm sure you can like, change molecules within your neurons and you will not change the experience. Right? Um, so that, that's the test. So what, what can I, if, if I change the activity of a group of neurons, I will probably affect um, the experience. So if, if they are within this um, NCC candidate region. Um, Interestingly also, even within cortex, um, it doesn't seem to be the case that the, the whole front of the cortex contributes much um, directly to the experience. That's a matter of extensive debate at the moment. Um, a lot of uh, people get really worked up about this because for a long time the frontal cortex has been very much associated with consciousness because when you report, when you act on your experiences, it's always involved. But now with um, so-called no report paradigms where you, you find the contrast of being conscious or not being conscious of something without having to directly report it. So maybe all that is recorded is your, your, your eye movements or something. Um, then the frontal cortex is much less involved. But that's again puzzling. So you have this, this big neural network um, and uh, only part of it seems to directly contribute to consciousness. So somewhere in there, there is a border between 
those neurons that do contribute and those neurons that don't contribute, and nobody really knows why. Yes. Can you, um, can you uh, elaborate a bit on some of these non Yes, yeah, so, so one, um, one, one very interesting uh, paradigm now is to actually compare uh, within sleep. So you wake people up, they, sometimes they dream, sometimes they don't dream. And actually, um, so it's been thought of that, that during REM sleep you always dream and during non-REM sleep you never dream. That's not true. Um, during REM sleep, sleep people report uh, experiences about 95% of the time and during non-REM sleep they report experiences about 40% of the time. So you wake people up and then you ask them, did they, were they just conscious? And um, people either say yes, no, or yes, I think I was, but I can't really tell you what the dream was. And so then you, you can compare, um, so the, basically the report is later. So there, then, the problem is, of course, that, that <coughs> memory is a necessary um, memory is necessary because if you don't remember, you can't report. So you have to quiz people just right after you wake them up because ten seconds later they might not even remember what they dreamt. Um, and another uh, paradigm, as I said, um, is so you <coughs> you have people do one task task, but you also show them other. So there is um you're actually measuring whether they see or don't see task irrelevant stimuli, right? So, so you have them do some task and then um, you ask them how many items were there, but what you're actually testing is whether they saw, um, whether it's red or green or something. You know, so, so just something that is not relevant for the task because then you can associate it from attention, for example, or other um, factors. Um, or even with, um, so sometimes with the binocular rivalry, for example, you you can see based on where people look which picture they saw, right? So there's specific traces that, that people will do on the pictures that look at the most relevant points of the picture, and those can be different given the two pictures. And you don't have to ask people what they saw; you can infer what they saw from the from their eye movements. For which on some level is still a report, right? That, that's also, but it's not an active report that um, involves a lot of your, your agency module. Well, how would some of these schemes uh, vary between testing under this theory or something like Graziano's attention scheme? Oh, um, this is all not, like, this has nothing to do yet with integrated information theory. Um, this is just the research that has been done on neural correlates. There, there is a, the only thing maybe is that, that it presupposes that there are these, so that, for example, the fusiform face area, that if, if it lights up, it directly contributes to the experience, whereas um, some other theories might pose that you need something in addition. So you need this to, to have enough activity to to activate some other region, which th then is also necessary for being for the stimulus being conscious, right? So, just the idea that if you find the correlates, they're sufficient for the percept, but that can be tested in, in some of this. Right? Um, okay, now I'm going to um, integrated information theory because it it takes a different approach than finding those correlates. So, um, it still uses the information as, as um, test grounds to evaluate predictions, but it's not based on the findings of, of the neural correlates. Instead, what it does is that it, it starts with consciousness itself, with the experiences, and without looking at all at the physical, it tries to um, characterize what are the essential features of, of every experience that you and me and that we yourself can actually have, right? So you look, you introspect, about your experiences and you come up with a list of um, necessary properties that, that the experiences have in common. Right? And um, then once I have this list, the idea, the theory really is that then um, I postulate that whatever physical system gives rise to consciousness must be able to account for these features. 
So the physical substrate of the conscious experience must also um, have these features. And uh, okay. before I say more about that, I tell you what the features are that are identified. And um, and these are the five um, essential properties that that uh, that we start working. Um, one is that, so those might seem a bit trivial to you, or you might think that they're not sufficient, or that there should be more. Um, that can all be talked about, but for the moment, um, what every experience is, every experience has in, in common is that first, well, <coughs> it exists. It's what you are immediately aware of, right? It's the the only thing. Um, that you can be sure of that exists according to Descartes, for example, like I have my experience, that's how I perceive the world. So mm -hmm. the world is an inference, your experience is what you have um, immediately given to you, and you experience it um, from an intrinsic perspective. So so there is an experience in the <coughs> subject. And with that I don't mean anything about self-reflection, just that there is something that has the experience and it doesn't need anybody else to see its experience either, yet you have your experience. Um, the second is uh, composition. So all my experiences are have, have parts that I can <coughs> attend to, for example. There is a structure. So, for example, if you, you see, there is a, a green towel and a red t-shirt, um, but you won't at the same time see a green t-shirt and a red towel, right? So there's, there is uh, items that are distinguishable within the experience. Every experience is very informative, like crazily informative, because um, you can distinguish, um, for example, all possible movie frames that you could ever see from each other, right? So, so the system that can do that must have uh, an immense number of, must be able to, to make all these distinctions. And, um, Experiences are always integrated, so you always have one experience. So it's a unified thing. You can never just just switch off half of your experience, right? and it's never kind of separate. Everything. So you you have different components, but those components, for example, sound, visuals, all integrated within this this unified um, experience. And then um, the one fact that raises the most discussion usually is, is exclusion, which means that um, there is a border to your experience. So experiences are definite. Um, in this room, we have 30 experiences. Right? So, so there is my experience, and at some point it stops, and at some point your experience starts, even though we're all physically connected. Right? So. So how do I um, draw the border around about what is part of my experience and what is part of, of your experience? And then um, there are clearly things that are not part of my experience. For example, um, my blood flow regulation right, is a dynamical system that happens uh, within my body, but it's not something that enters my conscious experience. Um, and uh, there's parts that for me are in my experience, so I always see color when I'm in the sea. Um, I can't just take the color out of the experience. Uh, it's always in. So there's parts that are in, that are out, and then there's also, um, that also applies to the spatial temporal scale, right? So, so my experience has a temporal extent and it has a spatial extent. Um, and that <coughs> should be explained somehow. So, um, so now we want to see, okay, what, what I want to describe um, or what I want to find in physics is a system that can account for all these properties. And um, the way that they, the, the starting point here is, um, is the fact that consciousness exists and it exists for yourself. Um, that gets translated in integrated information theory in, um, in physical existence. So the phenomenal existence is um, one aspect, and then the physical existence is the other aspect of existence. 
of the physical existence. And physical existence is a cause-effect power. So in order to exist, I must make a difference to something, and um, something must be able to make a difference to me. Otherwise, there's no point of being there. Right? So if you could never be picked up by any experimental device or whatsoever, you basically die. Um, okay. And the essence of the theory, and we got back to how this is all perfectly constructed, is that um, what IIT postulates is that an experience is um, a maximum of, of uh, cause-effect power that is given by the cause-effect structure of the physical system. So there's an identity, oh, let's start here. I have a physical stop straight, like the neural network in my brain. From that, I compute this, um, so as an investigator, but th that um, neural network has a cause-effect structure of how all its components are interacting and um, constrain each other. So they, they have cause-effect power on themselves and therefore form an integrated system. And this cause-effect structure then should be structurally identical to the experience. So for everything that's in my experience, I have a corresponding part in this cause-effect structure. And for um, right, and um, the 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 level of um, my consciousness. So if I'm for a healthy person, if you're conscious or unconscious, or if uh, then for different animals, let's say, the different um, amounts of consciousness that you can have, it, it's supposed to be great, and would correspond to the, um, to the integrated information of this, of this structure. And um, to give a short overview again about integrated information theory, so integrated information theory is distinct from, from other approaches to consciousness that it really starts from phenomenology and not from any behavioral correlates. Um, it, it aims to identify essential properties of every experience. Those are called axioms, but you shouldn't get hung up on this word. That's just a list of essential features. From these, um, it tries to infer the requirements that the physical system must satisfy to account for these, uh, for these properties. And then, um, with that formalism, with that theory, it has explanatory, predictive, and inferential power. And it leads to measures of both the quantity and the quality of consciousness. And there is a formal framework to characterize the intrinsic cause-effect structure um, that, can, that, that is formalized for discrete dynamical systems. And, um, yes. But, um, OK, you had a question. Yeah. So when you were saying that you identified it, the elements in the experience with elements in the, in the structure. Yes. How do you do that? Because there are very different kinds of things. So, like, how, how do you like, guarantee that everything in the experience corresponds to? Or it's like, yeah, how do you do that? Right. So, of course, it's not um, that we're already really doing that because it's difficult, right? But, but the idea is that. Um, a, for example, similar experiences should have similar cause-effect structures. <coughs> so you can find similarity relationships. And then you can go and really introspect about certain aspects of your experience. And one of the um, things that I briefly talk about in a minute is, is um, what we're starting to do is, for example, map um, the experience of space. So, so what all can you discern about um, space? Uh, from the intrinsic perspective, so the, the, the experiential space, and see if, if we can have a system that um, matches all these concepts, of all these relations of, of um, qualia within the experience should also exist. So every distinction that you can make in your experience needs to have a corresponding distinction in the class effect structure. The relations must be the same and um, right so so just there should be structural correspondence but you have to compare introspection on the one hand with the computation of the cause effect structure on the other hand and both is difficult. So 
Yes, it could. this. So is, does that mean that, um, so presumably some of the uh, information on the, the experience side would be uh, non-causal, right? It could be non-causal, non obviously causal relationships. Right. Uh, and those non-causal relationships are also there, supposed to be there on the right hand side. No. Yeah. Um, and not in the, exp so the idea is that, that there is, so um, in your brain there's informational relations, correlations, and so on. Um, we don't think that there is any such thing in your experience. Right? So, oh, I, I mean, maybe I misunderstood you. So, for example, um, so what would you call an informational relation in your experience that isn't causal? Well, it's, um, so it's do with, uh, you know, the shape, the geometric structure, or something, right? The geometric relations. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So if, let's say you see a triangle, okay, um, but you don't do anything with it, you just see it. It's still, so the fact that you see a triangle has a causal effect on the, so you only see the triangle if the triangle makes a difference to you. Um, and so it does have, so the mechanisms that account for the triangle still must have a causal effect on the rest of your brain. To to for for there to be the triangle in your experience. So what so what um, often so in terms of often just the naive idea is that oh there's a green towel here and I see a green towel and I see it I know it's about the world because there's this correlation between the uh, information out there and the information in my brain and. Um, and I see the green towel because in the world there really is a green towel. It, that, that's not the reason you see a green towel according to IoT. The reason you see a green towel is purely within your brain. It's intrinsic. There it doesn't have to be a world out there for you to see the green towel. Okay. So I think I just uh, so realized something while you were answering Nick. So when you talk about the cause effect structure, it sounds like it's the effect of the world and the things we're experiencing on us, rather than the the experience as the cause uh, and then the effect that it, that it might have on our behavior. Or yes. is, it, is it one or the other or both? Yes and no. So it's true that it's not the experiences that need to be causal on the physical system. The experiences have their relations within the experience, and the causal structure has its relations within the causal structure, right? So it's not that the experience has causal power on the physical or something. It's, it's, there's an identity between the structures and the postulated identity that um, it's the same thing. It has a phenomenal aspect, and it has a physical aspect. The physical aspect is cause effect power. The phenomenal aspect is your experience. But it's not that something in the world has a causal effect on you. It's intrinsic. So the causal effects are within the system. Anything outside, so for example, my retina um, activating neurons in my brain, that's a background condition. So it will set the state of the neurons in my brain. But if I set the neurons in my brain to that state without the background conditions, I could still have the experience. So there, there, um, the way that it's expressed sometimes is you have a dream guided by reality. So the, the reality sets your brain, and but the brain is what gives rise to the positive <coughs> structure, which is the experience. Can I say, I, okay, I didn't say it very so clearly. It sounds like the picture is more what's important about something being a conscious experience in this picture is how the experience is sort of caused at the neurological level, but not about how what that conscious experience can cause sort of in your behavior. So I might think something's conscious, you know, that means it's available for me to act on it, and that's important to consciousness. Is that part of the picture as well? Um, it's not necessary. So let's okay. say, if, if there were no cause of effect, clearly you couldn't, the system couldn't use it later, right? So if, if, some, if there's something um, I mean, we come to that in a bit when I actually okay. go through an example. But so, if, if there is a um, so, 
So let's say these are just two mechanisms, two neurons, and they both get input from these two neurons, right? And maybe there is some kind of inference that you can make about the state of these neurons if you, if you know both, like if you look at both. But if the system itself never, um, if the system doesn't have another element that actually gets joint inputs from this, the system itself is not making this inference. So it cannot use the information that is um, encoded jointly by these two um, for anything it does. So having this is a necessary um, condition for actually using the, the, the compositional higher order information that is in the inputs. But um, then acting on this, if this is in your brain, um, is not necessary for having the experience. So you couldn't use it if you, if you didn't have this, but it's not necessary to have the experience about um, or have the <coughs> distinction of the higher order information in, in your experience. Sorry, now that you've sort of explained things more, I think it would be helpful for me if you repeated what was going on in the triangle case. Because in the triangle case, um, so if there's supposed to be like a cause and effect structure in our experience itself, I don't see any cause and effect going on. When I, when I imagine that, obviously I'm not having that experience right now, but when I imagine having that experience, I don't think, I don't think of any cause, cause and effects in my experience. I agree there's definitely no. cause and effects going on, you know, between the triangular object and my neurons and stuff, but um, yeah, so. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, because that's not what what it is. So there's no causation happening in the experience. The experience is identical to the physical cause effect um, structure. So that doesn't mean that the triangle causes like anything else in your experiences it to be the way it is. It just is, right? So what we try to capture though is the relational structure. So you have a triangle. That means that here's a line, here's a line, here's a line. You see it as a triangle. There's all these dots, and um, there isn't there isn't a neuron that tells you that you see this triangle, for example. Right? That, that there might be neurons that kind of would encode the fact that there is a triangle abstractly more, but but not for this particular one. For this particular one, you only see the way it is because of its lower order components and um, together with its higher order components. And this relational structure is what has to have a correspondence in the causal structure of the brain. <coughs> okay, yes, thanks. I'll just, uh, yeah. so I continue for the moment, um, and then we can continue. So I want to say a few words about uh, the explanatory, predictive, and inferential power, and um, this is um, unimportant. Um, so important to understand is that, uh, yes, I think consciousness can be studied scientifically, but not as generally as, as people would like, right? So there is empirical um, facts that you can um, gather about your own experiences by introspection, and there's predictions you can make on these experiences that you can test by doing the experiment yourself or trusting that people tell you the truth about what they experience, right? And in simple cases, there's no doubt that, that you can do that, right? You can ask people to see something or not, and you should trust them in all these cases. So these predictions can be evaluated. Um, but then what we're often interested in is, is to assess um, consciousness um, in systems that are not like us. Right? And there is no, you, you can't verify if, if your iPhone is conscious or not. There is no predictive, um, there's no prediction that is testable that you can make about the consciousness of your iPhone. Right? The only predictions that you can make about consciousness are about the consciousness that, that we can access. That doesn't mean that you cannot say anything at all about these things, because once you have a theory, and that theory makes predictions, and the predictions hold up in any case that you can actually test them, which is our consciousness, 
then this is your best guess to apply to these cases um, where it's difficult to know. Um, uh, so you then go and evaluate the structure, physical structure of these systems, and then you can make um, a theory-based claim on the consciousness of these systems. Okay. Um, so, what kind of predictions and explanations does IIT have to offer? So, for once, um, it says that uh, the physical substrate of the experience must correspond to a maximum of, of cost-effect power. And in a bit, I'll, I'll talk about how this is assessed, but so, let's say we have um, perfect formalism to assess for every system what its, its um, integrated information value is, and then we can um, do that for the brain, and what we should find is that the maximum of the set of neurons in the brain that corresponds to <coughs> those neurons that directly contribute to experience should be the maximum cosmic power. If we were to find that the maximum cosmic power is in the cerebellum, the theory is wrong. Um, it does um, already explain um, why we are probably not going to find the maximum cause effect power in the cerebellum, and the reason is that while the cortex is a system with many interacting elements with uh, long-range connections, the cerebellum is um, organized very differently in a very modular way where the modules are only weakly interacting with each other. So if you were to measure the integrated information of a system like that, you should get a high value, but if you um, measure the integrated information of a system uh, that is very modular, the system as a whole will have a small value, and then each module might have some value of integrated information that's probably larger, but compared to the big system, it's very small. And um, it can also explain why, so there is a, there's a theory of consciousness basically just postulates recurren recurrency as a necessary um, uh, feature of um, conscious systems, but um, of course you have many loops in the brain where not all the loops are contributing to your experience, and that can also be explained based on the formalism and that there, um, there can be uh, a system that is strongly integrated in the sense that there is a close path, we might still not have integrated information or we might have a lower value of integrated information than a subset of these, of these systems. So um, we need to find uh, the maximum. And then the predictive power is that there could be conditions under which um, the the set of neurons that gives rise to the experience in humans is uh, not stable, it could move around. So um, maybe under certain task conditions, um, only a smaller part of your brain is actually contributing to, to the experience. Or it might, um, it might, so yeah, I mean, there's cases where they actually split uh, the brains of people in half, not so much anymore, but um, it's still done in cases of very severe epilepsy, uh, the corpus callosum is cut. And um, and what the theory would predict is that if, if there really is no physical connection in the cortex in between the two hemispheres, you will basically end up with two people, two consciousnesses, not one, right? Um, there's some evidence uh, for that, in that you can ask the two hemispheres independently. So the problem is a bit that you have to do it right away because there can be compensatory stra strategies by, by the people. and um, not usually not the entire the physical connection between the hemispheres is cut. There is still another um, small part where information can um, go from one side to the other. But uh, so typically one hemisphere is in control of language, but the other hemisphere can still control um, an arm or something. So there is a way to actually ask the hemispheres how many lines they saw and put them on different um, eyes and they could give you different um, answers or also what their hopes and dreams are and sometimes they give you different answers. <laughs> so um, 
this is uh, impressive, but what's also intriguing is that something like that could actually happen functionally while we're awake, maybe being immersed in a particular task that you focus all your attention to, you, for, you actually don't experience the rest, right? That, that could happen. And so um, we're not there, but once we have a um, precise enough measure of the maximum cost effect power, you could um, test it against all those cases and see if the predictions of the theory are correct. Right? Um, that this can actually happen, there is some um, initial evidence, for example, in, in dreams, that um, if you split the dream reports of people into very uh, different experiences that are purely perceptual, so you've been running and you saw things, and there are some examples of um, erotic dreams, Right. Uh, no, that's actually thought like, uh, well, okay. Um, so they see, watch TV in their dreams, right? Or um, experiences about thoughts, so maybe the best of uh, Yeah, I was thinking about inviting someone to my house that doesn't necessarily come with any perceptual content. And then you look at um, which brain areas are basically in a state that resembles wake then you can find that in the perceptual dreams, um, the back of the brain is, is like awake while the rest is actually still asleep, meaning it has um, slow waves, which are what you have when um, you're in deep sleep without dreams, usually. And um, in the thought-like dreams, it's the reverse, so the back is, is kind of asleep while part, another part of your brain is, is awake. And that, um, can give rise to the thought experience still by itself. Um, and another uh, experience, uh, experiment then in, in our lab is the idea of the functional split brain and they showed that not really that um, your experience necessarily splits but that the, that the functional connectivity between um, your motor area and your, your listening brain area can um, be dissociated in the, uh, when you're driving and you're listening to something distracting. Right? So, so they compared um, people that drive and get driving instructions that have matching content with what they see or you have somebody who's driving and they listen to the radio or some story. In the case that they listen to the radio, the functional um, connectivity between the areas is, is much decreased. Um, another uh, prediction here about the, the fact that IIT says that your physical substrate must be an, a maximum of cause effect power is that this should also be true across uh, spatial temporal levels. So the reason, according to IIT, that our experiences run at a scale of 100 milliseconds and they involve neurons and not molecules is that the neural interactions actually have um, stronger cause effect power um, than the same system at its level of, of molecules. And um, we do have a formalism that can explain um, how that a system and how a system can actually have more integrated information at a more macro level than at a micro level. Um, so, for example, here you start out with a system of 55 interacting. Um, logic gates or something, and um, when you group um, the system into larger components and you treat them as black boxes and only look at the causal interactions of their inputs and outputs, you can find that the um, the integration of their causal effects is actually larger at, at the macro level here at this, at this level. And, um, and that is something that can hopefully soon actually be tested and that we can um, look at um, perturbed neurons with something like optogenetics and, and see um, which number of neurons makes the largest difference to another area and then assess um, the specificity of, of neurons and neural groups and thereby see if, if the if the maximum of causal interactions does fit with the elements that give rise to the uh, parts of the experience. The second prediction is that this, this level of um, integrated, that the 
number, the value of integrated information should correspond to the level of, of consciousness. And the explanation here is that um, while we are awake, our cortex is in a state where um, there's a lot of interaction going on. Every, every region can talk to every other region. But in deep sleep, um, when everything has slow wave oscillatory activity, there is actually a functional disconnect. So the um, perturbing one part of the brain in deep sleep will not affect um, the rest of the brain. And the reason is that these big oscillations lead to um, inactivation of, uh, so while you're in the down state, no matter what kind of neural activity hits the, the group of neurons, they cannot resp uh, respond. So there is a causal disconnect due to the slow waves. And um, this has been tested in, in people by using kind of a very crude proxy measure of, of integrated information and a setup where um, people are zapped with a magnetic pulse to their brains when they're awake and when they're asleep. And then what is measured is the, is the um, dynamical spread of that, of that pulse in the brain. And uh, the result is that if you do this in, in wakefulness, then um, the signal kind of spreads everywhere over time and you get a pretty complex uh, dynamical response. Well, if you give the same pulse when somebody is in deep sleep and not dreaming, um, it stays localized and uh, doesn't spread across the brain, right? And then uh, this, um, the complexity of the signal can be quantified by, um, by something like a compression algorithm, which is used as, as like a, as I said, a very crude proxy of integrated information, but this has been very successful at um, predicting the, the level of consciousness um, in uh, experimental subjects, but then also in clinical patients. So this has been tried in all sorts of um, anesthetics and uh, non-REM sleep, and um, whenever people are so healthy, people are supposedly unconscious, they've been below this particular score on an individual person by person level. So there is no person that was unconscious that had a higher level of um, this compression based index than um, this line. And um, when you're awake, you're always above this line. And then um, having verified that there really is this individual um, uh, threshold this threshold can be applied to uh, brain injured patients and um, it has been very much correlated with the clinical findings and the assessments of the doctors except in maybe certain cases where the measure predicted more consciousness than the behavioral assessment did and then those people could be reassessed and uh, tested and some of them have been found to wake up and be conscious or communicate the fact short time. Um, the third prediction and that comes back to the triangle and all is, is um, the prediction about the content, that the content of the experience should be structurally identical to the experience itself. And um, Just in the previous growth, so what was actually happening to the people that were under anesthetic? Were they actually undergoing surgery or you're just kind of oh, tickling no, them or they, something? Uh, they're just, uh, you I'd like to see a bigger, if volunteers. I was going to go into surgery, I'd like to see kind of a bigger gap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, they, they, are, um, they are volunteers and, uh, yeah, personally I would probably not volunteer given what I don't know about anesthesia, but, uh, yes, so, um, but they all woke up again. <laughs> um, I just can't see from here, what is the y-axis? Oh, the, the y-axis is the um, perturbational complexity index. That is, um, you take the spatial temporal pattern, binarize it, and compress it uh, with a zipping <coughs> algorithm, like the Lempel zip algorithm, and that gives you a score. And um, that score, miraculously, is divided uh, between the right and, um, and unconscious and uh, 
the, the connection to integrated information is just that um, if there was a causal disconnect between the areas, there couldn't be a complex response, right? And um, so you have to have this differentiation of the um, areas, and they have to be integrated so that they um, so consciousness according to IIT would be a necessary. Is that right? No. No. Having a high score here according to IIT would be a necessary um, condition to be conscious. This is not one to one, of course, testing IIT. It's just a very crude translation of the very general principles that that the system needs to be integrated and it needs to have components that interact and differentiate. So for IIT, if the, the phi max is not trivial, does that imply that the, the entity is conscious? Yes. Okay, so that, okay. And so in these cases, the phi max for the people below the line would be um, would be trivial. Right, so so of course so maybe I should have said that more. We cannot actually measure phi yeah, in yeah. any reasonable physical system at the moment, and probably not for a long time. So what we need is approximations. We're working on approximations that are actually bounded by phi, or would give the same ranking as the actual theoretical measure, but not even that is really there yet. So this is an approximation, but just in the sense that at the extremes, it will fit with the IIT predictions. So if you have a very low value of the PCI, you will also get a very low value of phi. If you have a very high value of, of the PCI, you should also have a high value of, of phi, given that it's always the same system, which is the brain. And um, But the, the individual ranking, so it's not clear that this person actually is less conscious than that person, but according to IIT, that is not something we can say. But, but the theory can't say, like, if, if it's a low level, even if it's a very low level, the theory still has to say that that thing or entity is conscious, right? Right. It's still having experience. Yes, but um, then that's where this next thing comes in, and okay. it's a question of what are you conscious, how are you conscious, and, um, and then also the maximum part again, because, for example, it could be that the brain as a whole has then a lower value than individual parts of the brain. So then it could move to um, just as in sort of the cerebellum that the individual modules have a higher value of integration, integrated information in the whole. And um, that, um, that would mean that instead of, of your normal consciousness, you have like a million tiny mini consciousnesses that their structure just means that they differentiate maybe a couple of concepts, but not anywhere close to the rich structure of your wake experience. And Have so you given a, a I mean, I'm trying to understand what is the definition of five. Yes, like, we, I you hope know, to get you, there. You, you give a number as she uses it, so yes. is it some form of entropy? Is it it you, is you, you, maybe if you have a definition. Yes, maybe, we'll, we'll come form, to that. And I'm, I'm at to my last slide on the predictions, and that is just to 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 show you that we can actually we are actually trying to to be tested and do some of these things. And um, the the so the first study that tries to capture the structural identity. Um, prediction is that we try to um, map how space is organized from the intrinsic perspective to the causal concepts that um, the cause effect structure that is um, uh, arises from um, neural networks organized like two dimensional grids, which is very much how your visual cortex is structured partially. And, um, then you can find that that you have all these um, compositional uh, interactions, but I should first explain the formalism to be clear on that. So that's what I want to do now, and um, it's, yeah, that's I was but uh, okay. So it's also, so the, the case study that I want to show you the formalism at, to show you that while um, it's about the brain and all, we are working on figuring out a precise 
um, mathematical formulation of integrated information, what it means to be a cause effect structure. We do that not in physically realistic systems at the moment, but just in discrete dynamical systems of interacting elements, um, something like a neural network or a network of logic gates. And, um, and uh, so the view that we take is sort of starting from, from the neural network um, of the brain, and we see the brain as an evolved system of, of mechanisms. And, um, and so is this, which is a small simulated um, agent that is behaving in a world and has to solve some tasks, and it has sensors and motors and some hidden units. And over the course of a simulated evolution of 60,000 generations, which starts out with no connections between um, the elements, which are neurons, um, to having a, a structure. So the structure and the functions of the elements are um, determined by uh, the evolution, by encoded in a genome that is selected and mutated um, across the generations, depending on the fitness value that these systems have in doing a very simple task such as classifying falling blocks. So we have blocks of size three and six that fall down and they have to catch one and avoid the other. And at the end of their evolution, they're pretty capable of doing that. And um, as I said, their, their connectome and the functions of their units is encoded by, um, by a genome um, made of integers. So now I, I want to go through how we calculate um, integrated information in such a system. It's the simple, but um, the problem <laughs> with physicists is that much of this notation and the way to, to display the networks is, is very uh, not how it's done usually. So the, the, the units here are the elements that are interacting. They're kind of like logic gates. So this, for example, is an OR gate that receives two inputs from A and C. And that means that if one of its inputs are on, this uh, node will switch on in the next step, right? So this is the kind of system that, that we look at. And um, it can be described by a state transition probability matrix. So um, if I have the previous state of the system, I can make a probability distribution about its next possible state. In this case, it's deterministic, so I know that when I'm in in this state, I will go into this state, but it can also be probabilistic. There can be some nice So with this, um, this probability matrix is the is the starting point for the um, calculation, and uh, the goal is to find the the major complex, which is what would correspond to the physical substrate, the maximum um, this set of elements that has the maximal value of integrated information within the system. And for that, I have to calculate the integrated information value of all of these um, subsets to find the one that has the highest integrated information. But I don't actually have to do all of this because, um, because of this requirement of being integrated and having causal and effect on the system itself. Feedforward systems, uh, that by definition, have uh, no integrated information. So I can um, constrain it to all the all the sets that are strongly connected. Uh, so, right. And then I um, go through all these principles and I show you the uh, theoretical correspondence to those principles. So the first one was intrinsicality, which means that when we pick a candidate system, um, we're only interested in the interactions within that system. And okay. so I condition um, on this, this probability matrix on the current state of all the elements outside, they act as background conditions. Their state is fixed in whatever it is right now. They're not changed, so then I can reduce this transition probability matrix to the interactions of the elements that I'm interested in, given the other elements are what they are. Um, within this system now, um, I want to assess if um, any subset of that system uh, makes a difference to the system itself. So, um, does uh, any of these subsets constrain the past or the future of, of the system? So I want to see if A, B, C, or any combination makes a difference to the system itself. 
Um, and um, the difference that it makes is this information. So what I mean by that is, let's take C. C is an XOR, which means it gets two inputs here, and it will switch on if those two inputs are different from each other, and it will stay silent if those two inputs are the same. That means that in the system, if the XOR is currently in state one, it constrains the past of the system to be such that A and B must have been different. Right? So this is the information that, that this element has, just in its current state, not using any other information from any other state about its past. Um, and it can also specify something about the future of the system, because if I, if I know that this element is on, I constrain the next state of these two elements, which are OR gates, to be on for sure. So the XOR, by being an XOR within this system, has some information. And I can evaluate the amount of information just by comparing um, the information <coughs> it has. Maybe it's easier here. So if I know this, I constrain um, the path to be uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 for AB. But if I don't know the state, then I don't know anything about the path. So I compare it to to no knowledge of the state, which is here the flat uh, distribution, I can't uh, use anything. And this is, um, so we use information theoretical quantities, but we don't use the observed stationary distribution of probabilities of the system, because the system in its current state cannot know it. Right? So, so the, the um, the observed dis stationary distribution is something that an observer can assess by looking for a long time at the system, but it's not an intrinsic property of the system itself. So what we use instead is just um, the information at T0, and look how it's constrained against no knowledge whatsoever, which is a maximum entry distribution on the past states of its inputs. And um, the same for, for the future, except that we use a maximum entry distribution sent through the system, that's why it's not flat. Um, right. And then um, these two these two probability distributions are what we call the cause and effect repertoire of, um, of the system, of the element, and they specify the information that the, this element contributes to the system itself. We can also assess this, as I said, for, for sets of elements, and they will also constrain um, the past and the future, ideally, but um, we don't want to count them if the information that they have is no more than the information of their parts, right? So if, if A and B don't say anything above A plus B, there's no reason to have another mechanism AB. Um, and how do I test that? I do that by um, partitioning, uh, which in this example, for this is the example where you have X and Y, we don't need a mechanism X and Y here because all the constraints are explained by X and Y separately. Right? You can test this by cutting between um, cutting dependencies here, and you don't change anything in these cause effect repertoires. But um, if you do the same thing with A B and you cut constraints, and you try all possible ways to cut constraints, and you find that no matter how you cut the constraints, you always lose something. Um, you always lose some information of this, uh, of these constraints. This is uh, the value of integrated information of this higher so order. Is, you have a, so, what do you mean by phi here? Is it, uh, this is the phi. So, this, this yeah. so we have um, a small phi, the integrated <coughs> information of the mechanism. Uh, so Which you define before as the relative probability, or? Which I didn't define at all yet. <laughs> this is yes. the definition, basically. So the definition is that um, so for 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 the mechanism here, it will be the difference measured with something like Hilbert Leiber difference between those two probability distributions. So you have a, you have a metric on probability space. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. You, right. You used to need some metric. Yes. Uh, and. Um, which one and we then use? you measure the distance between the conditional probability and the yes. conditional. Yes, exactly. And the only important thing really is that it's not observed conditional probabilities; it's causal.
conditional probabilities, mm -hmm. like in Perl. It's so uh, the the, the shape of the metric you use in for AT space. Um, so at the moment we use the Earth movers distance actually, um, which is uh, uh, which is an actual metric where the um, global flag work divergence for example is not, but we're also working on having an intrinsic metric one that captures all the properties that we want. But it's not too crucial um, because all no matter basically no matter what uh, <coughs> metric you use, whether the uh, mechanism exists or doesn't exist uh, will be the same. It's just that the value of the integrated information of the mechanism will, will change with depending on which which metric you use. Um, right. So, um, right. And then um, the, the maximum principle for the mechanisms means that I don't just look at them um, at what AB says on the system as a whole, but I actually find the part of the system that AB has the most information about, and that will be um, my that will be the, the integrated information value of of that mechanism. So in the case of AB, it does um, specify information about ABC, but it specifies the most integrated information if I only take, if only about C. So its strongest contribution to the system is that it, it predicts the next state of C and that it says something about the past of C. And that gives it its um, maximum, its integrated. Small, in, so small phi is the integrated information of the mechanism within the system. And um, I do that for all the mechanisms and I find that in this case, um, AB is the only higher order mechanism that actually says something about the, its parts. Um, all the other ones are reducible and therefore, um, so as an external observer, you might still use them to predict things or whatever, but the system is not using any of the information um, of these joint uh, mechanisms. And by having done this for all the components, I have a uh, because effect structure. So the constraints of all the mechanisms in the system about the past and the future uh, taken together, the set of all these constraints is what I call the, the cause effect structure of the system. And now um, I have to do a second um, pass on these principles because. Um, a system that is not integrated can still have a cause-effect structure, right? So this this system of two completely physically separate components still specifies a cause-effect structure. So now I have to see again if that cause-effect structure if that is is integrated or not. And again, I do this by partitioning between the elements. So in this case, I cut all the dependencies, but there are none, so I don't change anything. Um, whereas if I if I cut dependencies in this system, um, I will lose some of the mechanisms. So I compare um, and I can quantify um, how much of the cause effect structure is lost if I partition the system um, in any way. And I, find, I have to find the partition that makes the least difference to the system, right? Because I, I could cut here and I lose everything, but that would just be wrong because I try to find the integration value, right? So I, I have to cut um, where the system has the weakest connections. And um, in the spirit of time, so then, okay, and I do this for all the subparts uh, to find the maximum, and in this case, we find that the maximum is, surprise, the system that I, I showed you, uh, and we went through, so A, B, C here is the set of elements that have the maximum value of integration. And I just want to point out that um, ABCD is also an integrated system, but if you add D to the set, your integrated information value will go down. So the maximum here is, is ABC, and that would correspond to the conscious part of, of this agent, um, according to it. Okay. And then um, this structure should correspond to its experience. Um, so, a point on this again 
I think I said it enough, but so the, the notion of inter information that we use is very different from the classic notion of Shannon information that, that is some correlation between um, a source and a receiver, so in, in terms of agents that's often that you correlate something in the environment to the behavior of the agent or to some internal state. Right? And this is not what we're doing. We're not even actually interested in, in any input-output function of the system. We just characterize how all these nodes in the system, all the elements of the system and their combinations, constrain the system itself. So it's purely intrinsic. What makes a, dif a difference that makes a difference from the intrinsic perspective of the system. And um, this is usually an average measure, so you, you have to change the inputs to see if they correlate with the outputs, but um, integrated information is a state-dependent measure, so you m might get a different value of integrated information, and you will get a different cause-effect structure depending on the state of the system. So, for example, an OR gate, when it is on, constrains its input um, to, it picks up three possible pass states out of four, but it is, if it's off, it picks up only the state zero, zero, so that it's more information. So the OR gate has more information when it is off than when it is on, right? So that is how the cause-effect structure can change. So if you see a tiger, um, that is more information than the fact that we just turned the dogs into tiger, right? Because there is a million experiences that don't have tigers, but there is uh, only a few that do have um, okay, I said this. So now, uh, if we go to evolution, um, the question on, on why consciousness evolved is um, is then, of course, still out there because I didn't um, give any function to consciousness. In fact, I told you that I'm not interested in in the input-output functions of these systems. So that often then raises the point that, that, oh, then there is no point, um, it's just an phenomenon or whatever. So A, it's not an phenomenon because um, it's a postulate of identity. So the phenomenology just is because effect structure is not something else that just runs with the cause effect structure, right? Um, and uh, there is a connection, so still there is a, a disconnect between um, intelligence and consciousness according to IIT. So there can be systems such as these uh, grids of interacting neurons that don't, like you don't have to connect any input output function to it and they might still have a high value of integrated information. And there can be other systems like AlphaGo, the, the Go neural network uh, artificial system that, that the, the Go player, and this is purely feed forward and therefore would not have any integrated information at all. And um, still, the, the beings that we typically grant, intuitively grant consciousness through, all lie on this diagonal. And that is where this perceived uh, correlation between int intelligence and consciousness comes from. And we still need to explain this, right? Um, so, <coughs> we tried to do this in a study based on these, these systems. So we let a bunch of these uh, agents, the animals, evolve. And uh, here you see an example where you start them out at generation zero and then they increase in fitness and will start to have a neural network. Um, and at some point in this evolution, um, they will evolve an integrated structure here, which is when you also start to have um, some integrated information. And, um, and in, in the first preliminary study, we could show them that that over the course of information evolution, the, the more fit the agents, the more likely they were to have uh, integrated information structures. Um, that um, a couple of years ago in a study we uh, we uh, refined the study by testing agents in in different environments of, of different difficulty and uh, different requirements for their. Um, capacity for memory and um, having internal states that um, save some information of the environment. And the result is that um, while, uh, so 
one task was a very simple task where they have to catch blocks of size 1 and avoid blocks of size 3 and those two blocks they can be distinguished just by the sensor input um, of the agent because there is a difference between seeing just one only one sensor gets activated ever or two um, both sensors could be activated at once um, the more difficult task of distinguishing um, eating so they have to catch size 3 and 6 blocks but they avoid size 4 and 5 blocks cannot be done just based on the current environmental state you have to uh, count how many um, blocks there are actually how, how long the block is and store that information in memory and um, with that uh, the agents that evolved very high fitness in the second task which are the red ones here they evolved um, much more integrated information on average and um, they also evolved more I called it concept it's the number of mechanisms so the irreducible sets of elements within the um, agent so how do you make them evolve? Do you mean, do you uh, just at say, play random connections and see? Right, so, so at first um, the, there's random mutations and then the mutations cause the connections to and differ. The mutations are connections and logical gates. Yes, the, yes, both. And, you, you choose them and then I choose which ones are the fittest um, from philosophy. So if they're all, at first they all have zero fitness, mm -hmm. so I just pick some, then they get mutated and then the process starts to actually evolve. So it's, it's trying to be relatively biological and that it has uh, point mutations and um, also um, larger chunks of DNA being deleted and added and duplicated and all. But, uh, so this is a different process of learning that you mentioned on this axis what is the and the alpha go. Right? Alpha go use deep learning mechanism. So they train they train our network in a different way. Right. Now so your graph is kind of scary because you, if you have another way to, to the, maximize ITT and they, have a, and they have a way to maximize intelligence, if you combine the two. <laughs> so right. so the, the difference so. in the in the is that with AlphaGo the structure is fixed, right? So there is a, a, the yeah. The, yeah. the layering. You, you have the, the layering, you have the yeah. and it's P forward connection. Here only the maximum <coughs> number of nodes that can be used is fixed, and then the whole structure can be, will evolve, right? So um, the interesting part is that whenever you let the structure evolve, there has been, even if it's feed forward, um, there the tendency of the system is to not be modular at all and to be very integrated and hard to understand. So there's a real difference between engineered systems that we want to understand and we put clear modules and they will most likely have very little integrated information to systems that arise by self-organizing um, their functions um, which tend to have integrated, uh, integrated uh, systems and, and the reason for that can actually be explained sort of using it, this formalism of integrated information because um, if you are an integrated system um, then you'll have more converging and diverging connections and that gives you more potential for for more functions giving the same number of, of elements because all um, sets subsets of the system can specify their own um, mechanisms that then can be used to perform the task right so um, if you have, uh, let's say here, you have uh, four nodes, and this one is a parity detector, and this one is a majority detector. This will switch on if the majority of nodes are on. This will switch on if an even number of nodes are on. Let's say that all are on and both switch on, right? Um, if I, if I have this integrated system, then I can have one output that uh, detects parity, one output that detects majority, and one output that, in this case, detects um, all nodes were on because it's the only possible pass state of these two being on. So I get three functions with these two elements, right? and um, and uh, I can also, of course, have this be different and have. Uh, 
just a, a linear, um, non-integrated way of coding these two, but then I need more elements. And, um, and recurrency, um, so this was, of course, just to be forward, but the moment you want memory, you can do this in a recurrent um, fashion much more efficient than you could with the big forward network. Um, so we're just about out of time. I don't yes. know if you want a couple of minutes to wrap just up. Just a couple and... of minutes. Um, I, I can do it in like three, four minutes. I just want to make some last uh, comments on something we, we talked about a bit yesterday, which is uh, the, um, when is a system an entity? And uh, when is, uh, so when, when can you actually distinguish a, um, a set of elements from its environment, right? And in, in some ways, that is what uh, integrated information also measures. So if you, if you take one of these agents and um, that, that has integrated information and it forms this core of elements that constrain each other, it will have some autonomy from the environment. So if you, if you look at it, it will follow the block, but then actually goes in a different direction. Uh, here it follows and then runs in the other direction and then like follows it again. So it, its behavior is not dependent just on the current state of the input, which um, this system, it does have a very complex input-output function. The camera can show you all the pictures you take with it, right? Perfect mutual information between inputs and outputs, and this is not integrated or um, autonomous in any way because you, you just have those modules that um, are not interacting. And, um, and so we, we measured the integrated information recently on a very small biological system, which is of the size that we can actually apply the whole formalism to. And um, this is the fission yeast cell cycle model, which is a Boolean model of how the cell um, splits and reproduces, and we found that um, the network uh, itself does have uh, integrated information in all of its biological states. Um, it will have a causal border here, so it means that um, this system forms a maximum of integrated information in all of its biological states, whereas uh, you can make a reduced version of this same network, and it will have the exact same transient through all biological states. So this would also give you the cell reproduction, but it doesn't have, um, it, it doesn't form a system by itself, uh, and in every state it will have a different set of elements that, that may be integrated or not at all, and um, so that would not form a system, and it wouldn't be, um, so, Having integrated information over over the course of your state and being the system that constrains itself is a, sort of a definition for a robustness and autonomy of, of an entity uh, within a larger environment. And then um, by comparing the two, you can contrast which functions, which mechanisms are there in order to perform the functions and which um, mechanisms are there for, for self-maintenance of the system. Um, which is important, this works if it runs perfectly, but if there is some perturbation to the system, this will fall apart, but, but this has some robustness. Right? And I'll uh, skip this, and just want to say, um, the last slide about the connection between um, consciousness and evolution according to IIT, even though there is not this, this function, is that so IT has um, specifies the set of um, features that are the essential properties of the experience. From there it derives a theory on what the physical system needs to, um, how the physical system needs to be constructed to be able to give rise to these uh, phenomenal properties. And then um, the question on why consciousness evolves shifts to why integrated information would evolve. Um, and that we can answer um, because it's more economical, because there's more robustness of integrated systems, because they are better substrate for learning. So if something in the environment changes, um, those systems will have an easier time to adapt to it. And um, 
selected. Mm -hmm. And the same for for select. And um, functional equivalence does not imply phenomenal equivalence. So a simulated system does not have the same experience as the actual physical system according to IoT. Because what matters is the actual physical causal interactions, the implementation, not something abstract like the algorithm. Right? And, um, and that means that computers that simulate our behavior according to IoT are not conscious, and computers that simulate the neural organization of, of the brain are also not, not conscious. That doesn't mean that we don't allow for artificial systems to be conscious, but they have to be built with a causal structure that resembles the brain, and not just an abstract informational resemblance. So, the question there, it looks like, it looks like from what you're saying, if you had an artificial neural network system that could evolve, yes. then you would call it yes. conscious. Yes. Okay. So if it could change its architecture depending on the data that you need. Yes, and also if I would, if for example, take the connectome of the brain and they have artificial neurons, um, yes. there is a, that, that could um, well count as a conscious system. There's still the, the matter of um, the right level of maximum interactions, and that could be straight <coughs> dependent. So it could be that for the biological system, the maximum of integrated information is at the level of neurons, but once I put artificial neurons, it is not. And so um, but that, that is very, that's the detail. So um, the last, so the intrinsic information um, is not about prediction, it's about the causal structure, it's about being the system and not what the system is doing or what's happening in the system. Um, um, there's the structural equivalence between phenomenology and the cause effect structure that is in the past of it. Um, not everything that can be decoded from the system is going to be part of the phenomenology, right? So not everything that a classic information theorist could extract from the brain is information the system uses itself or will be part of the experience. And redundancy is meaningful in causal terms because you actually do have two things that do something even though the information is redundant and um, the implementation matters. And that's it. We have a special show. Thank you. Um, I'm guessing people have quite a lot of questions, um, but let's take them upstairs to coffee, which should be up there. And